Hey everybody, welcome to Popwire. My name is Danny. You're here with us today for an exclusive interview with Taylor Hickson from Freeform's Motherland Fort Salem. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Danny. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for joining me today. This is awesome to get to talk with you. Yeah, this is awesome. I always get so nervous and flustered for these things. Thank you so much for having me. It's always so much fun. Yeah, and we have so much to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. A lot happened in season three of Motherland and over the course of the entire series. Um, but I really wanted to start out by talking about your art and craft as an actor and how, really how you developed Riel as a character. I mean, you know, the writing is one thing, you're given the writing, but to really make her an authentic person like you were able to do, I wanna know like what you did behind the scenes in order to do, do that. I mean, there's lots of tools. Um available to you as an actor. Uh, everyone always asks me, cause I say I'm such, such a terrible liar. Well then how can you be an actor? You know, you, that's your job, you're paid to lie. And I'm like, no, I'm paid to be honest and paid to bring truth to everything because that's what feels honest and engaging to watch. Yeah. I mean, no one wants to watch someone fake their way <laughs> through everything. It's not engaging and it's usually funnier than <laughs> more serious. So um, I think it's just using the tools of what I'm experiencing. Uh, and you, there's always so many parallels when you look at the psychology of everything, you can almost always find parallels between your personal experiences, either past or currently, and, and what these characters are, are experiencing. I mean, especially if it's written well, because it's written by humans about humans. and. Um, I think there's no avoiding that innate human emotion. And even if it's not apparent in the writing, it's your job as an actor to find those pockets. Um, so doing things like journaling from the character's perspective, I find to oh, be- that's so interesting. I find it helps, uh, and then keeping a journal separate from myself, I find it helps not only compartmentalize my thoughts at the end of the day, but also learn more about this other character and and help me draw parallels and and you know where where and what uh we we have as common ground or you know common denominators between these two people experiencing things and um in, in at, at first look in building a character i always do the funny thing where I, like i pick a hogwarts house for them i assign them a zodiac chart and you know a sun sign and i I look at their Myers-Briggs personality types and I give them a code. It's just all things for me that help me formulate a general skeletal outline mm -hmm. of, of a personality and then finding the moments in there that make it feel honest. Um, and just, you know, I find traveling really helps with that. Meeting new people um, and maybe engaging in conversations with someone that you generally wouldn't magnetize to instinctually. I find pressing your boundaries in terms of how you socialize or just people watching um, are really, really useful tools uh, in, in being an actor and trying to understand a lens other than yours. Yeah. So I, with Rail, um, there was a big shift in the energy that she exuded, right? I think. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in season one, she had this more masculine energy and then eventually that transformed into a softer feminine energy, like yeah. in season three. Um, what was that like for you? I mean, do you feel like you're a person who embodies both of those energy types or is it something that you had to sort of uh, find within yourself? Very much. I mean, I think I've always exuded sort of bro or tomboy energy and I, I think it was because I had to adapt. Um, I think I wanted to be taken seriously in a room and I found that people responded or were more receptive to masculine traits. And I think I just did this um, subconsciously. This was a cognitive shift that probably happened earlier in my youth for when I wanted to command attention, it was more useful to use tools that were seen as clinically masculine or you know, stuff that people are things that society sort of deems in the masculine, masculine or manly pool. Um, whether that be dumbing down your emotions 
or using anger as a tool to get other people to submit to you, which in retrospect, I find anger to be a very useless tool in terms of human engagement. It, it, that's all it is. It's either, it's a, it's a pissing war to get the other person to submit to you. And that has everything to do with losing your narrative with control, feeling like you need to control your environment and manipulate other people so that you can feel safe. And that usually is just a reflection of you not doing the work to make yourself feel safe. Um, so with, with the understanding that I was being evasive uh, with them, um, piecing out my own issues uh, and projecting. <laughs> uh, I think Rael was also doing this in tandem. So as much as I think that trajectory happened naturally, just in parallel to myself, I mean, very much of what Rael and was going through um, was simultaneous to what I was going through in my personal lived experience. Um, so I sort of find like it wasn't that she had the shift from masculine to feminine, it was that she found the Tao or the Tao, I, I guess it's pronounced, which is the balance between extremes or yin and yang, you know, finding a, a place that pushes the boundaries of extremes, but doesn't have that massive swing mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to feel like you are in control when in fact, having control means absolutely relinquishing control. And I think that was rails sort of kamikaze mission was that she couldn't control anything she was experiencing and so she was like okay well the only thing i do have control over is my life and i'm gonna end it because that's the, that's the one thing that i get a say in i'm going to take it before somebody else does that the way they did to my mother this is how i establish control in my society i don't want to, anything to do with anyone i don't want to feel connection because i end up feeling heartbroken and that's not my choice that's not in my control so I think it was her dancing with her narrative with control and trying to find a spot where she felt like she had something to contribute to her community where she mm -hmm. didn't feel lost you know she wanted value that's what anyone wants they want to feel needed that's human that's innate that's from the moment we're born we want to feel needed and you know, I think that's why the mother child bond is so strong. It's because they need each other. So I think it was just trying to find that because she, that was the one thing she lost was that mother daughter bond, you know, the mother child bond. And um, I think it was sort of Scylla and shortly after her cohorts, um, her unit that gave her purpose, that made her feel needed, that really changed the trajectory of the value she saw in her life. Yeah. Um, on the topic of Scylla, I mean, I mm -hmm. think Rael and Scylla helped each other transform and evolve. Um, for Scylla, you know, we see her go through this massive redemption arc. Mm -hmm. And I really think, I don't know, would you say that her love of Rael was sort of the catalyst for that? for wanting to see redemption? I, I mean, <laughs> with bias, <laughs> I would completely say that, you know, they, they founded that, that basis of connection, equaling value and equaling a, a place and belonging in society. They were society. They were both cast out of, of what they were told their place was meant to be. And once they felt like they couldn't establish their role, you know, again, that narrative with control and they, they took matters into their own hands saying, well, you know what, I'm gonna establish what value means for myself. I have control of that. And then understanding that that's a band-aid and feeling each other's power by giving love that is unconditional, giving love that, that you know, where the other feels needed and safe. I think that's the first time in probably their entire lives where they felt safe, they felt secure. That is, I think they've really bonded over that. You know, they, they found a pocket in which surrounding all this chaos and life and death, they felt safe. They felt a place where they felt taken care of. And I think that's something, you know, when you finally meet your person, there's that weird Freudian thing of, them giving the missing link of, of, you know, what happens when you part with your parents. Yeah. There's always that 
you're always going to need help. You're always going to need your parents. And there's a point where one day you don't have your parents. And especially if that happens early on, you know, I think that's where that Freudian compound sort of comes into play. And, you know, she was working alongside her mother. So I think there were so many likenesses to them. I mean, for God's sake, their names rhymed like Scylla and Willow. <laughs> it couldn't have been more obvious, but I think it was really the, the cutout of her mother as she filled that, she filled that spot that was missing in order for her to realize that she doesn't need anyone else to take care of herself. It was that push in order to fill her own glass. Mm-hmm. And it was only from there that she could be there for other people. You know, when, she, when she's so spread thin, you can't, you can't care for other people. You can't connect to other people because you don't want to. You're choosing misery. So it was Scylla, I think, that really pushed the shift between choosing the bigger, harder thing, which is happiness. She gave her something to fight for. Oh, that's so sweet. I just love Rayla. They are amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I heard that uh, you had very much to do with the giving of the ring when Rayle proposed to Scylla. how did you come up with that? And, and there has to be like a bigger symbolism behind the ring. I, can you please tell us? Yes, of course. Um, so, I mean, I had, I suffered a car accident early on in the series and it sort of postponed my shooting completely. So I was completely taken out of the storyline. So once I was back, we were sort of rapid shooting everything. So everything felt kind of rushed, like to get to the finish line and I guess I didn't have enough time to process this. You know, I read the script and I'm going, oh my God, I'm proposing. And then I was like, how am I going to, and I'm just like, you know what? This isn't something I can plan. This isn't something I can assess. Like I'm going to feel this way. So I was like, I'm just going to have to show up and be there and be there for my scene partner and look into her eyes and, you know, think of the life that they've built together. That's, I was like, that's all I can do. It, It is a spontaneous proposition. So I was like, that's all I can do. So, you know, we're halfway through shooting the scene and something, it felt empty. Like it felt like there should be a token to my promise. Like I, I promise I will fight so that we can have a future. I promise that I will give this to you or I will die trying. I, will, I promise this to you. And I felt like there should be something tangible to sort of seal this sort of unspoken promise. And um I went, well, I have my ring. Can I give her my ring? And they went, you know, the executives kind of said, well, witches don't really do that. It's not really customary. And I said, well, this ring supposedly was given, um, given to me by my mom. And I don't know that that's ever said in the show, but I, I don't know. If, like, I, I know that I was committed to that idea early on. I think I talked to the executives and they said, yeah, I mean, of course, like if that's a tool for you to use, absolutely but you know I think I talked about it so much in interviews and maybe to the fans like that it sort of did become it become it did become a ring that Rael got from her mom and that was sort of like her last token and I thought you know what better way to honor her mom as well as her civilian side from her mm-hmm. dad than to give her this ring which was her mother's but also that's how civilians propose you know with a ring and I I was like I I also want to honor her father and so I pitched that side of things and they kind of all look at each other and they're like well if we need to cut it out like we can and and I was like I I I think it'll work like I really think it'll work it'll it'll honor Edwin her father and so um we did it and I remember that I have really skinny bony fingers and I was trying to fit it on Amalia's finger and we did ring sizes so you see, I kind of have to like conceal her hand and then I sort of kiss her hand <laughs> in, in where the ring should be. But we had to actually, I sort of threw the props team under the bus because shortly after this, they're like, well, now we have to make a, another copy in, in Amalia's size and like, we can't use this one. So they were like pulling their hair out all of a sudden having to make this <laughs> copy of this ring. So I, sorry, her props team's fucking amazing. Thank you for doing that. But um, yeah, it was a bit of a conundrum, but I I remember just, it felt like the right thing to do. And I'm so happy that they kept it in because 
those takes were the ones that felt the most honest to me. Yeah. And that totally came across the screen. It was so just like genuine and loving. And I really think that message that you wanted to put into the story, but also give the audience, it was definitely there. So that was amazing improv. It It really was. It was so like compacted and, you know, there's so much going on in the midst of the scene to like sort of squish and bottle all of the emotion that has been packaged since you meet them in the pilot was super complex. Um, So, you know, we were kind of, especially me, I was, I was worried that it wouldn't read. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was, it was perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So right before the big double wedding, Mm -hmm. Rayla finally got to go to the lighthouse and you know, the, the lighthouse was this, this theme that sort of popped up ever since uh, season one when Scylla told Rael about it. And what would you say is, is the true like symbolism behind the lighthouse for these two? I mean, if you look at the sort of figurative versus obvious meaning, I'd say it's, it's a beacon. Like it's a, it's the light in the dark. It's the, it's the thing that you know, they had to set a goal to chase. Otherwise, otherwise there wasn't a future to envision. So to, to sort of pick a place that felt malleable, like they, mm-hmm. you know, they'd made it there. That that was a symbol of their love and um, a symbol of their connection. Um, it was a light in the dark. I just think, yeah, it being such an obvious actual beacon was brilliant. But, you know, it was a place where they could feel safe and completely isolated from everything you know on the on the shorefront of the ocean and um and just to have themselves in a, in a place that felt safe and that, that has felt safe for Scylla since you know her youth um I just think it was an incredibly special place to sort of have their you know honey honeymoon <laughs> you call. yeah you call. yeah 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 I think, I think for me personally, like that was what tied it all together for me. You know, I mean, obviously the wedding was beautiful and it was great to see that, but just seeing Scylla and Rael finally make it there. I mean, that was just like, um, that's what they, they needed, you know? Um, yeah, they've just been dropping these crumbs, you know, from the beginnings of season one. Um, it felt like they really worked to be there they really earned being there and I felt like it was so symbolic of of their connection like the thing that stands taller than everything and is a beacon of light in the dark and it's it's such an a funny juxtaposition of you know yin and yang like the pitch black surrounding mm-hmm. them and and then the one light I think that is like well, yeah, light meets dark I think that's what could be more perfect than that yeah, and then actually it kind of ties into what Rael and Scylla symbolize, right? We have death and then we have life. And it's like, oh, that's so beautiful. They're, they're yin and yang, the balance. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're oh infinity. Them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, a lot happened in season three. Um, there are some pretty like obvious themes. We have the theme of hope. Uh, we have the theme of redemption. Um, also just, uh, people unifying their voices and utilizing that power that comes with that. Um, what is like the most important message that you would like to see the audience take away from this, this season, but also just the series as a whole? Yeah. I mean, the most obvious thing I guess would be hope when you're looking at from a storytelling, uh, standpoint, but obviously the position of a more literal sense, I would say, you know, representation and, and happiness and the constant fight for, for goodness and to see that prevail. I mean, no <laughs> story does that anymore. No one spoon feeds you the happiness that you want. They're like, nope, we're going to make it realistic and, and horrible and sad. And I'm just like, that's not, every story that's a choice you can make for yourself i think 
happiness and hope so much is a, is a choice and it's a constant battle. It's not to say that there won't be obstacles in your every day, whether it be in, in terms of menial tasks, but just the underlying encouragement of hope and, and choosing happiness for yourself, even when sometimes it's the most difficult choice. Um, I think it's quite, quite an expansive view. I mean, choosing misery is like, it's a, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut and you're there. Hmm. You're there, you get to sit in the thing that feels comfortable. You get to sit in the thing that feels familiar. You don't have to push boundaries and, um, and you never grow. And as awful as that sounds, I've caught myself doing it. And I think it's a very human thing to get stuck in that pocket. Oh yeah, I it with you. Deep, boy, it runs fucking deep. And if you let yourself, it's just like, it's, it's a really quick shortcut and you always have to work harder for your own personal happiness. You always have to do the, make the harder choices, do the harder thing, but it's going to be the thing that's most rewarding. And it's going to be the thing that, that gets you over the hill where you can see beyond everything. You know, you can, you can stand on top of the hill and see the expansiveness, see, see your potential. And I think misery is a, a quick stop to four walls, but you know what they look like. You know that you're safe in there and that you don't ever have to, you know, push yourself because you can't understand happiness if you don't feel pain. And I think the deeper the pain you feel, the the larger the increments that you, you know, the, 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 the capacity of emotion expands. So the, the, the deeper misery and grief that you have the capability of feeling is, you know, it, it's outward. It's then, then the, the roof for elation expands with it. So I think, I think it's that, you know, I think it's just with every season expanding the physical world and, you know, it becoming from Fort Salem to society to engulfing the entire earth, <laughs> like on that, on that grandiose scale. And I think it, you know, it's, there's so much to take from that and, um, and the, the encouragement and representation of fighting for the bigger thing and doing the bigger thing for yourself. Yeah. But I that's such an empowering message. Um, yeah, Elliot did a fantastic job. It was brilliant. The entire writer's room, Brian and Amanda Tapping, you know, the, all our execs, they, they worked their asses off to, to make this. And I'm so happy that it's, it's in the hands of people who need it. And I think this storytelling was definitely needed. I know I needed it. Yeah, it, it, it's very obvious how much care you all put into this show. And I think that's why so many people of such a, you know, from so many different backgrounds and just, there's a huge collection of people, diverse people that have been able to see themselves in the show and be empowered in, in a variety of ways. And I think when we're talking about representation of queer people, you know, and historically we've seen uh, the barrier gaze trope and that has been really awful for the queer community. Um, and we thought it was going away for a little bit and then it came back. And I would have to say that just seeing the relationship between Riel and Scylla, and then actually having you guys not only survive through the series, but get married and have that happy ending. I mean, that just, it impacts all of us so deeply. And um, yeah, I'm just, I know that myself and, and all the other queer fans are so grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that was mind blowing to me to hear so many accounts of like, this is, we haven't been given this before. Like that mm -hmm. it always ends badly. I, that's one thing that I was really ignorant of. Like I've really, I feel like I've always had representation in media growing up. That was never something I was deprived of. So having the show come to air and it wasn't until it went to air and, you know, there was a, an actual reaction to it that I processed what was being made. You know, I committed on such a small level to just being a good scene partner. And that was, you know, I was enjoying the, the artistry of 
building a relationship. That's for me, the point of life. And so, you know, I was just enjoying my craft and enjoying spending time with someone and really getting to know someone in, a, in an intimate way. And to see how extensive the storytelling can, you know, it really took on its own form, but it was something that was incredibly eye-opening to me. I couldn't fathom watching every relationship that I felt I could see myself in die. It's, you know, some kind of death, you know, whether that be a character or a happy ending or, you know, one of the characters leaves the queer relationship for a different kind of relationship or, you know, following something where you, you felt wholeheartedly that you believed you saw yourself in this person or these characters and, and really rooting for them and then having that taken from you again and again, that's exhausting. And I, I was just like, I, I can't, I didn't wrap my head around it till I joined the show. And I'm so grateful for our writers team for making the commitment to put something out that felt honest and if it was something that was needed and it's it's 2022 and the fact that this isn't a constant is gross so i'm incredibly proud of our team for for you know making this happen and giving it a form and giving it a life and and for people to you know find safety in this and to to find that they could relate to my character or anyone's character that's just it's profound it's so beautiful thank you and um i promise to keep working for these kinds of projects thank you that that means a lot to hear that and um we only have a couple more minutes left but uh i was going to ask you you know how has this show impacted you what, what are you going to be <laughs> taking from this um <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, like it, it's completely changed the trajectory of my life. But like I was saying, I was so negligent in in my duty to, you know, all of the queer people in my life and um, and beyond that I wasn't paying attention at all. Um, so it's completely changed the trajectory of my career and the projects that I take and what's important to me and charity and events and everything. Like it's completely transformed my lens of the world and society and my own relationships. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, it's started this fire in my stomach and it's, you know, I've made a promise to myself and, and uh, to the queer community that you know, I have something I'll always keep fighting for. And, you know, I've started writing my own stuff and because it's, it's, I want to see, yeah, I want to, I want to see this stuff come to life. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's changed my life in a profound way. Yeah, that's amazing. And I am so looking forward to seeing whatever you're going to be producing in the future. <laughs> oh my God. I can't wait. I will, I will be that. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um so we're at time but i was wondering if you have time to do like a quick little game yeah let's do it yeah for okay. sure I, have, I think i have like a few minutes before i have to jump on something else okay perfect yeah this will just be quick um of the core four mm -hmm. for each character what do you think their go-to cocktail would be if oh just, like having a night on the town this is gonna be very hard for me to separate the castmates I know and their character <laughs> they don't have to be separate I mean if it if you think it works well then yeah I think Grail's like a pickleback or something like a shot of whiskey yeah. and followed by like a car of pickle juice she'd be something like weird and old manish like it's a really old style weird country thing um and then I think oh man I would say Scylla's probably like a dirty martini, like something very, very classy, sophisticated, yeah. but also a little bit of, mm. 
Um, Would it be gin or vodka? I'd say gin. Nice. Yeah, I like that. Uh, And then I'd say Abigail might follow suit and like trying to be classy, but also being like, I need to be efficient here. I'm on, I'm on work. Like she's always on like post mode. So maybe like espresso martini to get that like okay yeah so <laughs> kick in there I can see that or she would do something just for optics like an old fashioned or something like yes mm. I I am strong I will drink straight alcohol <laughs> <laughs> I will take it like a champ um, and then <laughs> Tally would be like a Shirley Temple or, <laughs> or like Sex on the Beach. Like a Cosmo, maybe. Yep. If, I Cosmo, she's like trying to get drunk. <laughs> but maybe like a spiked Shirley Temple or something. Yeah, yeah. All right. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, this was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. That was such a great ending. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, take care. Um, and I guess I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for joining this exclusive interview with Taylor Hickson. It was so much fun to get to talk with her. Um, Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to PopWire's YouTube channel and follow us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Also, don't forget to follow Taylor Hickson. She is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and her information will be down below in the description of this video. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.